Hi, good evening. I think this probably won't encourage people to join if you figure we have long protracted interactions, but I'll, I'll be the last person giving an, inter inter an introduction. Here. So uh, tonight's speaker is Cole Armstrong from the University of Iowa. Cole is a PhD student in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. He just finished his second year, He'll be going on to his uh, third year now. Um, he went to college at Penn State and uh, now he is in uh, his research interest at Iowa is in the area of ultraviolet astronomy. He's working with uh, Professor Kerry Hoadley there, and his PhD thesis topic is a combination of, first of all, uh, building instruments for uh, ultraviolet astronomy from space. It turns out if you want to uh, look at the stars at ultraviolet light, you have to get up in space to do it. That's a good thing, as it turns out. But uh, so Cole, I think, will tell us a little bit about what ultraviolet light is and spectroscopy as well. And so part of his thesis research is dealing with that. And the other part is dealing with how the ultraviolet light from very hot luminous stars can essentially boil all the way, all the matter around in the protoplanetary disk around certain uh, types of very hot and, uh, and luminous stars, which is certainly a very interesting topic. And I might say Cole also is a member of the Cedar Amateur Astronomers, so uh, it's really good to have a, um, a speaker who's uh, one of our members. So, Cole, we're all looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I guess you don't need this microphone. That, that's your I have my own. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Spangler, for the introduction. Uh, so first of all, to answer a potentially burning question on everyone's mind, um, yes, my last name did help influence my career choice. Um, I had to go either with geology for coal or space for Armstrong. Biking and weightlifting really isn't my thing, so I'm going to stay away from them. I'll stick to the science. I like thinking um, most of the time. But so thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, I will be talking about spectroscopy, what I like to call the colorful way to view the cosmos. Um, and for the most part, I hope to give you guys a little bit of an introduction into what spectroscopy is, how it happens, um, as we have an exhibit in the very back of the room here that allows us to explore spectroscopy in real time, um, although maybe not as applicable to space directly. Unfortunately, I was not allowed to bring my star in for the exhibit, so I had to leave that at home. <clears throat> but uh, so where to begin? I think the best place to begin is simply with our finite vision in the night sky and why we use spectroscopy. So very briefly, our optical elements that we typically are looking at the sky with is going to be our eyes. This is limited both in how dim of an object that we're able to see, as well as how far away. Um, that will also affect how dim it is. But we do have some upsides for it. For example, if we were to compare your eye to, say, like your phone camera or so, the average iPhone has about 50, uh, sorry, like 12, 14 megapixels or so, whereas your eye has about 560 some. So quite the upgrade as far as how much detail that you can capture and also gives you a little hint as to why a picture never really does it justice. <clears throat> but another element of this is the magnification in the field of view. Our eyes are rather small, so we do not have much room to work with as far as being able to change what we're seeing in the vision. Uh, here I have an approximate picture of what you would see from like a magnitude six um, and up, which is the um, eyes limit as dim as it can see. Um, and then on the left here, I have circled Mizar and Alcor, which is a binary star that you can see in the handle of the Big Dipper um, in particular. Find it. Oh, there it is. In particular, um, in the crook of the Big Dipper, this is two stars orbiting each other, but your eye should be able to resolve even a fourth to a fifth of that distance anyhow. But like I said, not really adequate for space. So let's go and do an upgrade for the telescopes. Um, one of the biggest things is going to be the aperture size. That's going to allow you to see more light, collect more light, see fainter objects. When you are in a dark room, like I am right now, and you guys looking forward, your eyes are a little bit more dilated to try and see more light, collect more of it so that you can get better detail. But if you already step outside when the sun's up, 
your eye, your pupil is going to zip right back down to being small. Uh, another element that we'll throw into the upgrade is going to be the camera because we need something to be able to measure the light with and the camera is going to be able to sit there and stare. Your eye is going to be doing a continuous process so you're not able to really capture faint detail quite like a camera is able to. Whereas with the camera, I can have it sit here and stare at something and even in the dark cubby and the lobby area there, I the camera would be able to pick out details from the picture so long as I let it go long enough. And then not only that, but there's filters and different energy levels that you can focus the camera in. Um, so here is a bunch of all sky surveys as well. Um, this is the optical bandpass. So this is what your eyes, this is the type of light your eyes like, but there's a lot more detail out there in all the other energy regimes. Um, and in particular, my favorite one is are these two right here, which is the far ultraviolet and the near ultraviolet. So this is some, definitely you need like SPF 1000 for these two. Um, I don't know, maybe a lead suit or something. But this is only going to give us so much. In particular, we're really only going to get like pretty pictures. And if we are able to observe something long enough, we can get dynamics out of it, how it moves about in its environment. So on the left here, I have a video of the crab or GIF of the crab nebula over the span of about 10 years or so. So as time goes on, this supernova explosion that's fairly young was able to expand and this astronomer was able to capture it in real time. Um, it goes up in time and then unfortunately goes backwards so that it gets this pulsing effect. But I assure you, it is not doing that. It is simply trying to all escape its very violent pulsar interior. Another element that we can get out of it is called photometry, which is just the light curve over time. And this is really good for orbiting bodies and motion. But that's kind of it. We can't get too much more out of it. We can maybe get some guesses, um, but we need a little bit more. We need a different tool for this. So um, what are we going to do? We're going to look at what people observe in nature, see if there's any weird thing that we can abuse that deals with light in order to gain something else. And the very common, very common thing at the time was to take a glass prism and just to shoot a beam of light through it. And who else would have done anything in physics in the, 16th, in the 17th century if it wasn't for Isaac Newton um, and his prisms? And what everyone was doing is they were taking this glass prism <clears throat> And they were shooting a beam of light to it. And the very important aspect of this is that whenever light interacts or goes through a material, something will change. And in this case, when the beam strikes one of the sides of this prism, um, it starts to separate. And when it does so, um, it's actually going to be separating by its energy until it leaves the prism. And in which case, about 400 years before its time, Isaac Newton discovered the Pink Floyd album cover. So that's rather interesting. I think we need to be looking at his notes, perhaps. But what you can see here is the fact that it actually diffracts by color very concretely. Um, I can't make the joke if I have the rainbow also in here, but you can see it start to spread out very concretely um, if you were to actually see the prism go through. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, and the way that we, or that I like to phrase it, is very confusing, and that's the fact that the light beam bends inward towards the material. Um, don't worry about that too much. It's not terribly important. But it, the higher energy you have, the more in you're going to be, and this applies for the prism. Uh, it was Isaac Newton who actually really first sat down and tried to like quantify some of this stuff, and he applied it to some of his other theories. And so because of that, we call him the father of spectroscopy. Um, despite other people having also contributed to the work, um, he was most prominent and put forth. Uh, however, it only gave this smeared spectra that you see right here. Um, it's exactly what you would see in your sky, where it's all of the rainbows, and there doesn't really appear to be any breaks in it. Um, about flash, flash, fast forward like 100 years or so, 
and you have people using lenses and such uh, 10 years or so, and you have people using lenses in order to actually focus the spectrum. Um, eventually, though, I mean, you can only make these so large before glass pieces become unwieldy. So um, what a Bavarian glassmaker had done, Josef Fraunhofer, had replaced the prism, a nice glass triangle, with what is called a diffraction grating. And this one is fairly similar to what uh, he would have done and he would have crafted. And there are a bunch of these frames in the back, um, in the back display there. And if you hold this up, you can actually see all of the diffraction patterns off of like the lights on the ceiling and in particular, very specific elements that we'll get to later. I don't know if you're gonna be able to get anything. Uh, yeah, you can see some on the sides, right? So it's a lot cooler if there's like, I don't know, more light to it. Maybe if my eye was a camera, I could be more sensitive for it. But at the time, it was really only looking at one main spectra, the sun. That's like the only astronomical body we were really applying it to. Um, we were looking at other things, but um, that wasn't as nearly interesting to me. So it's not in here. But you know, what is a grating? Like what makes the grating so much better than the prism, aside from the fact that if you want to make this larger and larger to get those um, lights to split off more, it becomes really large. It's also just not as efficient. It doesn't do it as cleanly. So uh, this page is probably horrifying, and I don't blame you. Um, but fortunately for us, light acts like a wave. Um, Isaac thought that it was a particle, but it really isn't. It's a wave. And we can think about them propagating across space, very similar to ocean waves. Um, over here, uh, I have the, just the difference between the grating and then a prism as far as what their light paths do. So there is a little bit of a difference there. But for the most part, as I have a wave coming in towards like the seawall here, if it comes in completely straight, as you can see these ones in the middle, of the seawall are, uh, once they actually pass through, it's not just a giant rectangle of water rushing towards the coast. It spreads out. It starts to become spherical, like on the sides. And you can very clearly trace out arcs down here. Ooh, throw in some annotations for it next time. It'd be better. But that's just one. And if you've ever played jump rope and had a friend on the other side that liked to mess with you, um, they probably were doing something that would make your jump rope just go as one stick, essentially, back and forth. And the way they do that is that if you are both holding the rope and you both move off to the one side and then back, you're not really doing much. You're just both going and trying to move it along in the same direction. You're not getting any snake pattern to it. And that's what you see over here. Uh, oh, off to the right. Um, if you guys go in the same time, you'll get nothing. But if you do it opposite, where I go left and you go right, we can start getting some constructive interference and they add together. Um, this is best seen here. You can see these ripples with just one um, uh, coming through here. But over here, when you have two of these cove entry points, which there's another one off to the side, um, you can actually see very stark up down black white pattern right there. So you can think that these white points here are going to be the peaks of the trough of the wave. And then the dimmer points, the dark ones here are going to be down here into the troughs. And they will add and we can go through and measure them. That's cool. That's the wave mechanics part, but let's actually get to how that works into gratings. Well, fortunately, there is a nice setup for it back there as well, but I can do the exact same thing with my grating number one go to the side here as what we have on the camera. And I can place a detector right at the rainbow. And voila, I get a spectrum. Um, in the case of the camera that we have back there, uh, it does kind of have a similar look uh, as far as the spectral readout, but this isn't what we were seeing with the initial gratings, nor is it what you would see with this handheld filter. 
what you actually see with the handheld filter is instead going to be this. Something just splayed off to the right in the case of this dark grading, uh, this dark spectrum down here, you have very defined lines. And when you look at a light with these, in particular like an LED, you are actually really able to see different colored projections that match very specific wavelengths. More on that later. <clears throat> but there's a lot of these dark lines. And in particular, I chose this one here, this middle spectrum, because that is the spectrum of the sun. An interesting thing to note is the fact that the spectrum peaks around green. This is a little diluted, the air got into it. But the sun actually does peak around green, so it's not yellow. The sky just does that. So what are what's in these colors? What excites them? Uh, what generates them? If you go and you are the crazy chemist of the early 19th and 18th century, you were going and you were exploding and vaporizing materials, probably not meant for your lungs. And you were looking at what light was produced from these. And after a very long list of experiments, we came up with a massive chart of all of the elements and what their lines mean. Um, and, or I should say, it gives them a, like a unique identifier. If I see a spectrum that has these two peaks, there's a third one that's very dim, like right about there or so. If I see that in a spectrum and I see that's very strong, that tells me a little bit about the object because only hydrogen makes that spectrum. There's not a single other element on this table that produces light quite like hydrogen does. So that's a little important. And ultimately, what is the cause of that? Well, we have our atoms. And there's a lot of these guys. Um, if you didn't know, you're actually probably sitting on them or breathing them. But anyways, um, as light comes in and touches and interacts with the material, like I said, something will change about that light. And sometimes a photon can be absorbed. And when it's absorbed, an electron gains energy and bumps up to some upper state. It jumps up to a higher energy state. But if you've ever put a ball on the top of a ramp, you'll know that things don't like to stay at higher energies. They like to try and go down and find some place where they can sit secure and not really be moved. And the electron likes to do the exact same thing. It likes to try and be as close to the nucleus as possible. So what does it do? Well, it just got a bunch of energy, so it can give that away to return back to its position um, over here along the blue light. So whenever we see an electron jump up, that's what we call absorption. It's going to absorb the photon, um, whereas whenever we see the electron jump down, it's going to emit a photon. So in particular, all of these spectra off to the right are instances of an electron jumping from a high energy state to a lower energy state. Fortunately, we get to see that too with our eyes. And it's much more apparent when you go and you look at like the carousels. Um, you can really get an idea of how unique all of these guys are, as well as this periodic table is represented as like a true periodic table uh, with a display in the back as well. So um, if you put material, if you put energy into the material, you can get it to generate some amount of light. And that's what we see when we are looking at things with spectroscopy. So um, I'm sorry. This is the astronomy club. Um, this has all been physics. So let's like apply this to astronomy, right? When we look at our colors from space, essentially, we're actually able to get three main interesting uh, artifacts and properties about what we're looking at out of spectroscopy. Um, the first one that I'm going to talk about is going to be temperature, second being composition, and motion. So in the case of temperature, the hotter the material gets, the more it's going to radiate, or the higher energy it's going to be able to give up. So in the case of the deer that I have over here on the left, they are hot, they are warm-blooded animals, but their surrounding, probably not so. 
In the case, you can very readily see that the low end of the spectrum is 65 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the warm-blooded creatures are going to be warm. This is an infrared camera. It's going to be looking at the heat that an object gives up. Um, if you heat up some of the deer meat, um, it'll probably become delicious. But uh, aside from that, if you heat it up hot enough, you could actually get it to the point that it's going to glow. Um, and yeah, that's probably not good for it. But I think we can try some of that using the infrared camera over there. Maybe I'll go boil some water so we can do that after you're done. I like that. So uh, totally didn't even know that it was over here, but that's very convenient. Uh, on the left, we have a looks like an optical. So that's what we would see. And then on the right, we have the infrared. Um, the gentlemen sitting up here that are in the view of the camera are appearing white. And that's just meaning the highest point of intensity in this image. Um, I probably could have chosen a black and white image for this as well. But in this case, it's just a sliding scale. And purple to yellow is actually one of the highest contrast color combinations that the humans have. So that's what it's good to do. Um, and then a side note, um, spectroscopy, we also are using to really try and to optimize our energy use. So in the case of an LED, these are very specific wavelengths that the bulb is giving off, typically in order to try and get a desired output, like a clear white, like medical room white, or maybe something softer, more like candle. Both of these are going to be made of different colors, but we don't need to produce light across the entire spectrum for that. Um, and not only that, as you can see, this LED bulb is not producing nearly as much heat. But when you go up to the incandescent bulb and up the wattage, you can see that this bulb is actually just straight up heating the air around it. All of the fuzziness around this bulb is actually the air taking heat away from the bulb. If you're looking for a light, you don't really need that heat, right? That's what the heater on the side of your floor is for. Um, and this is ultimately why we choose LEDs for that. But these are higher energy outputs, so they're going to also be a little hotter. And as you saw with the hottest, it was giving off quite a bit of infrared. So not only does something, as it heats up, become brighter, um, it also actually starts emitting in higher and higher energy levels. So here you can see the top of the bulb isn't actually very hot at all, and it's quite dim. These are similar color scales. But as we go up, and in particular up the wattage, is really starting to affect the environment. And uh, you see more yellow around this bulb, or like a fainter yellow, whereas over here you're just having complete saturation even beyond the bulb. And that's what you see here. So this is just our wavelength from blue, the highest energy, the hottest color that we have, to red, the coolest. And these dotted lines here are two different types of stars. And this um, solid one is going to be um, the hottest of the three. Being at 7,000 Kelvin, um, it's going to be putting you into the regime that you're actually able to produce the cool kind of light, ultraviolet. Probably warm, but. Um, the other thing is, uh, like I said, the sun peaks around green, so for the sun it comes up, and you can kind of picture it cutting through and coming down. And this, as you get hotter and hotter, even up to, say, like pulsars and the O-type stars, which are about 30,000 Kelvin, that this whole curve is just shifted so far into the ultraviolet Um, so as far as temperature goes, it's really good. You know, we like to know how hot things are, um, and it's what allows us to really understand that the sun is like a cool 6,000 some degrees Kelvin. But I'm more interested in applying this stuff to astronomy, and in order to really get at um, application in astronomy, you kind of need to know the temperature of the object, because if I'm just warm enough to be able to produce my own light, you're not really going to be able to know, or if I'm just warm enough to produce my own light, I might that might just be able to drown out or just like make uh, the atomic emissions just not super apparent. And it's important to know 
the atomic emission and how hot the object is if you really want to get into what exactly it's made of and how much of it is there. So this is where the components of the object come into play. And in this case, um, having our atomic transition is, uh, is key because it takes in energy and then it, it lets go energy. And it will always be the same. If it picks up just enough energy to come to the n equals two here, the second energy level, then that means it has enough energy to only emit n equals two to n equals one. So the small arrow and that red arrow, uh, blue and red arrows will always match and it doesn't matter what happens. If it doesn't have enough energy, it's not gonna really be able to drop down, um, but that would have to be some weird sustaining mechanism. But the important part about that is that not only do you take in of specific wavelengths, but you're going to be giving it out. So as a really hot body, just like a star or something floating around in space, it's going to be hot enough that it's going to give off its own light. And we call that the continuous spectrum. It's a thermal spectrum, not super important. But um, as the light travels, things will happen to it. Uh, space is not empty. I think in the vicinity of us, it's at least like one particle per cubic centimeter um, just outside of the solar system. Um, but as the light travels through space, it's going to go through and it's going to pass through material. And as I said earlier with the prism, if something is going to, if light is going to pass through or interact with the material, something is going to have to change. In the case of light passing through the prism or some materials, it will change its path. But if you're made of a bunch of light, like Isaac Newton postulated and was correct with, that's the only thing his particle theory was good for, um, was the fact that as white light leaves this object, it's going to pass through all that stuff in space, and it might interact with the, with the material. And if it interacts with it, well, the atomic transitions can happen, but only for those specific wavelengths. So what we get at the end of the light coming out of this gas cloud is actually going to be this absorption spectrum down here, where I have my continuous spectrum here, but I am missing very specific wavelengths. Where do they go? Well, if you look at the spectrum I skipped, the emission spectrum, um, spoilers, but all that energy is going to have to go somewhere. And it's either going to go into some amount of motion for the particles that are in that cloud, or what's most likely going to happen, uh, especially after a long enough time, is that it's going to leave that cloud. It's going to try and just give away its energy, try and get to as low as an energy state as possible. It doesn't want to have it. It wants to be zero energy kind of like me on a Sunday afternoon. So as it comes out, um, it's the same thing as what those chemists were doing. They just gave a very specific material energy, and they were seeing all of that light come out at a very specific ratio, or sorry, in very specific places across the spectrum here. So if you were to combine these two spectrum back together, in theory, you should get back to your continuous spectrum. So uh, where, where does, there's a really close example for this one too, actually. Um, it's actually uh, right here. It's called air, right? We have, a, fortunately, we do have a star that we orbit around and it gives off a spectrum that's not, well, it's definitely not as pretty as this one, but uh, it gives off a spectrum that we can approximate to a pretty spectrum if we want to. Um, but since we have space capabilities, unlike Newton, we are able to go above the atmosphere and actually collect that as well. So over here with the yellow one here, this is the um, ideal black body. It's the sun with, we're not caring about the elements around it or what it's made of. It's just hot enough to produce light like that. But there's a lot of stuff between the sun and us. And not only that, um, sorry, just not even including the atmosphere, there's particles that are in between, such as well, predominantly hydrogen and some other dust, perhaps. And all of that helps to reduce the light that we actually receive. So down here on Earth, this rainbow spectrum and the black region here is what we actually would see. So as you can also see over here, the ultraviolet 
gets extincted really quickly. Um, and then we also have big dips in the infrared spectrum. And the difference between before going through this cloud and after going through this cloud means that whatever that light passes through has to impart that energy somewhere. And so ultimately, infrared light is heat, is bounced around in the atmosphere um, by upper atmosphere molecules. Sometimes it's redirected, sometimes it's not. Um, in the case of UV, um, this curve um, hasn't really been affected by the ozone. So that's pretty neat. But um, it's definitely a determiner in helping to kill the amount of UV light that's able to make it to our surface. And fortunately, without air, uh, well, well, without air, we'd, we'd probably not be able to breathe. But uh, the more important part about it is that it protects us from the ultraviolet, and in particular, the high energy cosmic rays as they come through, try and get through Earth, but um, the atmosphere is able to absorb most of it. Um, so that's going to be the temperature and the composition of the object. But there was the third. Um, these two come directly from observation and comparison to in-lab testing. Uh, this next one's a little bit more difficult to attain in the lab, and that's going to be motion. And there's a couple ways to do this. Uh, it actually runs off of the exact same premise of the Doppler shift. Uh, light is waves, as I had said earlier, and so is sound. Uh, if you live in Iowa City, you hear three times a night uh, a train coming through, and as it comes into town, you hear neat, neat, or something like this. And then as it's leaving town, you hear something a little deeper. But if you're next to the train, um, you will be able to tell that they are not different whistles. They are the same whistle. It's just that the truck, or sorry, the train is able to go fast enough that it compresses the wavelengths together, and it does an effect like this. The faster the truck is going, the more it can be compressed. And in the case of like an airplane sonic boom, this is happening to the extreme where the plane is approaching the point where it's able to just break through that. And that's why you see the videos of the plane passing and you don't hear anything until like it's well beyond. Uh, so this is a terrestrial example, but how does this apply in space? Well, um, space actually has a lot more things that are moving a lot faster than we can make here on Earth do. And in particular, if we're looking at, say, like a different star system or something, we can look at how the star wobbles like so. Um, ooh, oh, thank God. Click the wrong button. Um, as the star goes around its orbit, like so, uh, we could watch this star go back and forth. But a vast majority of the stars that we are now more really interested in studying, we can't even resolve, like, back and forth motion like that with the telescope. We can't be like, oh, it's here one night and then the next night it's over here. We can't do that. And this is also very important if we're looking for exoplanets because that's what this example is. Um, in particular, uh, this would be like perhaps some large Jupiter and this would be um, a star that's probably about our sun size because Jupiter is large enough that it's actually able to make the sun orbit not around the center of the solar system. Um, the sun is not the center of the solar system, unfortunately. It's slightly outside of it. Um, but if we were to be able to look at our star system of uh, the very far away, um, sorry, this is like a top-down view, so that's good if it's like directly on us. But if we're looking at the edge of the dinner plate, the edge of the disk for the solar system, uh, we're seeing this bottom guy, and we actually will need to use spectroscopy to really get an idea of what's going on here. Um, and what we see here is the same thing. It's just that as the star is going away from us, the wavelengths, these black lines, are shifted to the right, and then it's going towards us again, and it comes to the left. The faster it moves towards us, the more left-shifted it is, or more blue-shifted, and then the faster it's going away from us, the more right-shifted it's going to be, or red-shifted. And that's a physical consequence of the waves adding up together, exactly as we see in our terrestrial sound example. So that's just one application. There's actually more because this is one object doing just the one thing going towards and then coming back. It gets even more confusing 
if your star is rotating very fast. So some of these really big O-type stars that have really fast revolutions um, also exhibit this other quality, uh, which is the strength or the width of this black line can actually increase as you have your star rotate faster and faster. Um, you have this back and forth motion off to the left here um, that we just talked about. So if you combine both of the effects at once, because you have one start, one part of the star that's really hot and going to be emitting light moving towards you. So you have the first part of the train and you also have it moving away from you as it's rotating on its axis. When you combine that right shift pulling and that left shift pulling, so um, the extremes of the right and then the extremes of the left, we get a wider line. Now this also does change in brightness. The energy has to go come from somewhere, um, but that doesn't really matter. And we actually use this uh, um, as a really strong link to how, um, how massive stars are, because if it's spinning at a certain speed, you can actually use, um, like stars will not be able to rotate at a certain speed before they start spinning themselves apart and like throwing material away. So this is a really good indicator for how heavy a star is or how much material will weigh on its surface, if you would like to say. Um, so there's another application for this, um, although I'm not as important to me, uh, much to the grievance of someone in the crowd. Um, but you always hear astronomers talking about perhaps like a redshift in a spectrum, uh, in particular, whenever you talk about in extragalactic astronomy, um, you always see them referencing some Z value or some redshift value. And that's just because as the universe is expanding, um, the space between particles and everything else that occupies space is also going to be growing. And if you're far enough away from me, you will also be affected by the expansion of the universe in that the distance between us will grow apart. How sad. And yeah, it really is. But what does that look like for us? From us, from our point of view, we can just say we're stationary. But you're moving away some fast speed. So you're getting this truck simulation here. And we are this observer as you're leaving us that way. The more, the faster something is going away, it's going away from us very fast. It's lengthening its wavelength when something's coming towards us really fast it's shortening its wavelength um i always like doing that and then i make fun of myself like oh i hit myself in the face sometimes i do not on accident but so right out of the bat off of this we're able to really get a good idea of this motion of back and forth of a star um but we're also able to get about what the star itself is doing. And then also, this doesn't just apply to stars. It's applying to galaxies that are far away, but also the nebulae. And this is ultimately just one tool. Our, all three of these are important properties, and we use them as great tools in astronomy. And I think the cooler one that is the craze right now, and I don't blame anyone, is the fact that we use spectroscopy as a method of planetary detection. Um, oh, well, sorry, it's planetary atmosphere analysis. Um, we do also use spectroscopy for planetary detection sometimes, but it's not as not as important. Um, there's better ways to do it. But basically, uh, as an object goes in front of a star, it's going to block light. But in particular, if you are a star that has an atmosphere, or sorry, a planet that has an atmosphere and you go in front of light, ah, light will pass through this stuff for the most part, pretty easily, right? Like I can see you guys very well and you can see me. And if we stand on top of a tall building, perhaps we can see a tall building that's very far away in the distance. Um, and so light or air is really good for that and just really gases in general. And as the starlight passes through the planet, we won't be able to see it. Like the planet just disappeared. The star is that bright but it will leave its effects and the spectrum. So if this is 
the spectrum of the star, this white line here. This red star, um, this red planet here is occupying this small percentage here. That's going to be the energy that's removed. As the planet passes in front, that atmosphere is going to eat up some light at very specific wavelengths. And what we can do is we can subtract a before spectrum and during transit spectrum, and we get just the planet back and what the planet spectrum looks like. Um, now, this is a very sensitive process. Um, this, for example, here is amounts of light blocked parts per million. So there's a crap ton of photons zipping through this room right now, much more than a million. In fact, I'd be willing to guess well upwards of billions. But um, this is a very sensitive process, and these error bars are rather large. But this is what James Webb is really geared towards. And we're still building up the statistics and really doing the nitty gritty stuff in order to get an idea of these atmospheres. So in the case of this one here, this is WASP-96b. Um, the light passed in front of the plant or passed through the planetary atmosphere and we were able to catch it. I don't know, pretty neat stuff. If you were to hold up, I forgot the penny at home. If you were to take a penny to a globe that's about this size, the atmosphere is not even the width of that penny. Like it is the skin on this planet. So this is really good if you, especially if you're trying to study like hot super Earths um, that have large atmospheres or in particular gas giants, um, which WASP 96b is. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so this is, okay. Um, so Steve had just asked what this x-axis here is, and this is the wavelength of light. So this is from James Webb, which is over here, focusing on the infrared, and this is in the micron regime. Thank you. So this spectrum, very small, much less powerful than the sun, and this parts per million is what's removed, but the sun's giving out a hell of a lot more than that. All right, uh, my final tool that I have um, at my disposal, I guess, um, is not spectroscopy specific. This is going to have to be in combination with something. Um, or sorry, this is also spectroscopy specific, but we can get out more dynamics of not just the star that's emitting the spectrum. Um, in the case of our truck here and a supernova explosion here, in the very center, we have a pulsar that's whipping up all of this material around in the Crab Nebula. And as that material goes away, we have very specific material racing away, racing towards us in all directions. And therefore, it's going to want to absorb very specific wavelengths of light. Um, what this looks like, though, in the spectrum is we have material coming towards us. So we have wavelengths that are shortening. Um, but then also on the very back end of this, this expansion like a bubble um, has material going away from us very fast as well. So it all or originates out from the center like so. And as all of that light goes out, it's going to hit this material, heat it up. And that material is then going to want to pass it on. It doesn't want to hold on to it. So what we see with what these are called here as P signy lines, not really important, but we see this absorption of the spectrum and then the emission. So this was a not a not the Crab Nebula, but this was a different supernova remnant that was much older, and this kind of allowed us to understand. Uh, this is a P signy line directly from it, and it's one of the first applications um, from the Chandra Observatory of these P signy lines, and you have these correlations of. I have material coming directly at me very fast. So I see that material absorbing light. Since it's coming towards me, it's going to be wanting shorter wavelengths of light. So that's why blue shifted material likes to absorb there. But I also have a bunch of other material that's hot and going to be emitting light. And on top of that, I have material that's on this outside here going to be racing away from the center in all directions. 
So therefore it's also going to want to come back through. So if I'm down here, I'm also going to see light emitted from the material in the back, which you can imagine is back behind this swirling vortex here. And all of these effects combine to give this wacky shape that really is hard to approximate through other means. Um, and this is used for both like supernovae explosions, but also stellar winds. Um, so that's all I have. And I do have these this takeaway slides. Um, and the main things that I would like to highlight really are just how spectroscopy works, because I feel like we always just read the word and it's, oh yeah, it's that prism thing. But there's a little bit more to it. It's a lot of the wave mechanics. And I really think that's the more interesting part about it. But then not only that, um, not only uh, due to how the different means that light is produced, um, spectroscopy allows us to actually go through, pick it apart, and get that temperature and composition. Um, and for most things, we're also able to get motion or something about the motion out of it. Um, and then also that this is a very sensitive process, as we saw with like the James Webb, and also with these P Signy lines. Um, these were less than ideal error bars that we were hoping to get. And out of, I think, eight lines that we were supposedly supposed to be able to find, my partner and I only found three. So that was rather fun. But yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so we got to give away some door prizes. So uh, why don't you draw three tickets first? And you can read off the numbers, or I can if you can't read them. Uh, three, five, zero, five, one, five, three. No, Come put on. your hand down, Sal. <laughs> <laughs> Three, five, zero, five, one, five, three. So the first three are for these diffraction grading glasses. Spicy. Um, ticket number 3505140. You have to come up here and pick it up. And then the third ticket is 3505147. Yep. Seven. Okay. So now you got to draw six more. <laughs> So the rest of the door prizes are these binocular prisms. And if you look at them the right way, you get a spectrum. You kind of have to look through the narrow angle, the 45 degree angle. And of course, due to refraction, the image is shifted, but you can see a, a spectrum. So these are uh, from uh, seven by 50 military binoculars used in World War II, and they're all used, but they're all in good condition. I should have gotten a ticket. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's like, man, <laughs> someone trying to build up their optics catalog. <laughs> um, three, five, zero, five, one, three, one. Baker. Come on up. I won't bite. I can't say anything about Noah, though. I'm going to stay in the corner. Three, <laughs> one. Yep. I only vouch for myself, sorry. Uh, three, five, zero, five, one, three, three. Three five zero five one five seven. 
<clears throat> Just what you always needed. <laughs> I was told I couldn't get a door ticket. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Three five zero five one four eight. Three five zero five one three eight. Pull the pen apart. Three five zero five one four nine. That's the last one. <laughs> Right. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you can just put it there. Um, we have two young astronauts. One of them got one of the prisms. The other one. I hate to have you go home empty-handed. <laughs> <laughs> Questions in the room or on Zoom. If you're on Zoom, you can feel free to unmute or put it in the chat, and I can read it out loud. And if we have questions in. If we have questions in the room, I'll go around with the microphone. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, one thing I may have missed or maybe you didn't talk about is what is it that you learn from the ultraviolet spectrum that you don't learn from the rest of the spectrum? Yeah, so for the ultraviolet spectrum, this is going to be one of the like the lowest orders of hydrogen uh, or one of the smallest transitions, I should say, from second to the first orbital. Um, and this is going to be like the hydrogen is one of the largest populations. So uh, there are very energetic regions that have hydrogen in them, but we don't really get to see too much of them um, based off of where they are. There's a lot of other material around them as well. Um, so that's one big issue. But the other thing is that um, as go here, if we look very far back, I should people. No. Sorry, I'm blanking right now. I don't even know my own. Here we go. Okay. Um, so over here on the right, the ultraviolet spectrum is actually blocked out pretty much all along the galactic disk, but there's a lot of high energy regions right above the galactic disk. So there's things that are just really straight up blocked out. Um, and a lot of this also exists around like the centers of like, or in the gas around uh, supernovae explosions. So it also gives us like an idea of the structure, um, but also in particular, the observational research that still just getting into um, I've been more on the instrumentation side so like all the instruments and satellites and so um, but the uh, presence of these really hot stars can actually start to quench um, star formation and not only that but they're also able to basically hinder planetary formation as well so if you have like earth for example was or sorry the sun was formed in one of these um, really dense regions with a lot of material. Um, but if there was an O-type star, which is the hottest star that there is in the vicinity, a lot of that UV light is actually able to strip away the disk and start wearing it down. And if you don't have enough material, you're not going to be able to accrete um, enough uh, matter to make planets. Yeah, no, I forgot to mention that. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions in the room? Yeah. Uh, I never thought about it before, but uh, in terms of the energy, it's, I guess, lucky that a lot of this is, is in the visible region on all these uh, objects or these uh, elements. So how much of that is, is there a lot of it up in infrared or ultraviolet or whatever, or is it most of it invisible? Um, actually, it's it's all across the board. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of... The more electrons you have um, orbiting around you, the more crazy your spectrum can really get, and it can become very crowded. So uh, let me conjure in my mind where it is, because I'm not able to think. 
So if we look here, for example, um, they these will go well beyond also into the ultraviolet. Um, and that's usually where you're really seeing these atomic transitions is going to be in the visible regime, a little bit into the ultraviolet. And you don't see them too much outside um, because beyond that, like the electron is usually just able to become free. It's able to get enough energy that it frees itself from its atom um, when you get too far beyond the ultraviolet. So yeah, yeah, it's predominantly going to be visible and the ultraviolet with some with some guest appearances elsewhere, but. Other questions in the room? Uh, so on this graph, you mentioned- Hold on, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> You're fine. On this graph, you mentioned uh, some lines are fainter than others. What makes them faint? Um, good question. I'm not entirely sure what specifically I meant when I said faint. Um, but in as a, as far as these lines here go, some of them like straight up appearing faint. Um, that's most likely, I would say, either like something with the detector being um, not being able to like potentially resolve it, or these are very fine lines. Um, but it's also a matter of what state is going to be most common um, for whatever they're going for. Because in this case, the more energy you put into them, no, that's probably what I was meaning. The more energy you put into the atom, the more frequent you are into material or like a tube of gas, like you see in these back here, um, the more you're actually able to see these transitions. So if I have a tube of helium or hydrogen or so, and I start heating it up at one point, I'm going to only really see the red and this line that's barely visible right here um, won't really be there. But if I give it a little bit more juice, um, I can really start to get down and see it. Um, so it is a little bit of a power input thing as well, but as far as like how often it's going to occur. So is it more the the probability of how many states the electrons are jumping between, or sorry, photons? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Is it more um, the probability of how many like states, how many shells, energy shells, the electrons are jumping between? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a mix. Uh, it's a little bit of that. Um, they, they need the energy so you can give it like very specific values if you're using like light from it, uh, light from a specific source. Um, but a lot of these energy levels like do exist. Like even if you're hydrogen with like just one proton and one electron, um, just because you're just one proton and one electron does not mean that you won't have like N equals 10 or something. I mean, the more higher energy, the higher energy level you get to, the more likely it's just not going to be maintaining like connection with the proton because you can get far enough away that you're just going to zip away. So there is a little bit of that to play into it. So um, this is not a question, <laughs> but like, about three weeks ago, I was touring um, um, a glass factory in Wisconsin, and they test the impurities in the glass, and they use spectroscopy to figure out what got in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was another thing that I was like, oh, I didn't know they do that. That's yeah. another application to the same, you know, principle, I guess. Yeah, when I was, uh, when I made the slides and I got to... Uh probably yeah actually right about here um i have written in my notes ah this is for astronomy talk um because this is primarily all analysis for like physics and we do use it like all over the place mm -hmm. like um like from plants and stuff like this um will shine a white light through like a leaf or something of a living plant and that can also give us like a little bit of an idea of what type of green light or red light or so that that plant would prefer. So we can really hone in on um, a bunch of different like biological processes and such. I don't see any questions on in the chat. Anything else in the room? Ooh, yes. Well, I was out pulling weeds in my backyard today. And so I, I put on sunscreen, which I think is a good idea. I was reading on the bottle, but it said, this effectively blocks UVB radiation. So I thought that's a good thing. 
But, you know, I know that UVB radiation is from about 300 to 350 nanometers. What, with the instruments that you're designing, uh, eventually these gratings you're working on, what kind of wavelength range are you aiming that for to study hot stars in the interstellar medium and so on? I know it's a lot shorter than UVB radiation, but what kind of ballpark are we talking about? Yeah. Um, so the gratings that we are working on in the University of Iowa in the lab that, I, um, that I'm part of, um, our grading fabrication is looking to do um, pretty far into the UV, like down into like 90-ish nanometers, um, all the way up to, I believe we're trying to hit a little bit closer to the end of the optical regime. Um, but I think for the most part, the gratings should be fine for a little bit beyond those ranges as well. Um, but within that range uh, is really where we start to see like the Lyman alpha spectrum and stuff like this. Um, and we also get to see some other cool fe uh, features of hydrogen there that we don't really get to see too much of elsewhere. Well, yeah, we get to see it a little bit in the visible, but. Since they uh, made the lines, the colors that they are in the spectrum, our eyes are much better at yellow and green, right, than than at blue and red, and so it just looks that way. Maybe there's maybe there's plenty plenty of energy coming in the ultraviolet or the infrared, but our eyes just don't see that color, so it makes it look more apparent of yellow and green. Mm -hmm. No, that's definitely um that's definitely a factor that plays into it, and that's really the reason why like sunscreen is so important is because it blocks the UV light and that's damaging to our cells and our material that makes up all of our biological processes. You can really go through and slice that up. So, um, and also as far as our eyes go, being like attuned to this, like this is the regime that we evolved in. This is the light that we've seen ever since our that pesky lizard crawled out of the ocean. Um, but uh, we also see that because our eyes are peaked more towards green. Um, your phone camera, as advertised, um, is probably saying 60, uh, for iPhone cameras, is probably saying 64 megapixels. But that's not true, realistically. They're actually 16, and that's because they do um, a red pixel, a green pixel, blue, and green. So they focus actually on the two green because that's where our visual acuity also peaks as well. Um, same thing if, like, night vision goggles are sometimes like in particular like the army it's not just green because the army's colors are green it's um actually your eye is able to discern shades of green supremely well so, so did that answer your question a little bit yeah, as well um so then in the uh ultraviolet and in the infrared um they may be just as strong as the greens and yellows but our eyes just don't pick it up in this way of demonstrating. Yeah, um, our eyes our eyes won't like see it as a color. Um, so like in the infrared, you can definitely feel it as heat. Um, and same thing for the ultraviolet. Um, I actually just put my hand in the beam path of our ultraviolet light source in the lab the other day. And I'm like, why is my hand getting warm? Ah, okay. So um, it's a little bit of a threat. But yeah, um, it's definitely it's definitely still there. Like even um, through our atmosphere, there is a little bit of UV light, um, and there are some creatures that are actually able to see more to one side and then also more to the other. Like in particular, bees and most insects also see a little bit of UV light as well. So it's definitely still there. Okay, and so the the lines that are below that are like the blue lines, uh, they're just as powerful as the yellow lines in power, but we just can't, we, we can't mm. see the blue lines because I'm, our eyes aren't good at it. I'm sorry, are you talking about in this graphic here? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. In other words, as we as we colored the, the blue lines there, blue, uh, they may be just as powerful as those yellow and green ones, but we just can't see them as good. Yeah, um, that's okay, is, yeah. Is that true? They, yeah. they all have the same power? 
Um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, the uh, one of the reasons why it takes why you really have like in particular with the thermal radiation, why you have to heat up something so hot to really emit appreciably in the ultraviolet mm -hmm. um, is because if you're able to produce light in the ultraviolet, you're looking for the easiest way to get rid of as much energy as possible. So um, you're not going to stop producing in the lower energy regimes. So um, what we have with uh, like what you see here hmm. is as we get hotter, more red starts appearing as well. So the colors do become strengthened, but they're all at different, um, they're all at different energy yeah. values. So I guess the yeah the power is actually going down. That's why our eyes prefer the yellow. Can you put the microphone a little closer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a little um a little bit of power indifference um that you can see. Uh, and it made finding some lines very frustrating in some labs that I had to do, but yeah. Awesome. Any more questions in the room? One more. So I think somebody told me that the diffraction gratings, like you have an example of that we have more in the back, um, are about 13,000 lines per inch. Um, I'm assuming the diffraction gratings for looking at the UV would be much finer than, is that correct? Yeah. Um, so my lab is producing gratings upwards of 1,200 lines per millimeter. Um, and this one is 500. So they do get finer and finer. Um, and the finer you make them, the more you'll see, uh, the finer you make them, the more you'll see this rainbow go outwards and you'll be able to get much more focus on the ultraviolet regime and what is the manufacturing process for making these um so we we're sticking with one right now um as far as the lab goes um but the traditional one that's the most expensive and most difficult is that we have a nice little small plate of silicon and we put a, a like fluid on it that goes and puts like only two microns or like a very small thin film, um, and then we are able to go and shine light on it to go and produce these. Um, then we do that either by just directing a beam along it with, sorry, we direct a beam of energy either like via just electrons or by using. A different diffraction pattern or um, a different type of grading um, or something similar to this, I should say, um, to project the pattern. And when we remove it, uh, we're also able to or remove that thin film. We go and are able to actually remove some of the material below it as well. So we get this little picket fence like structure here, but it's on this side instead. We don't do transmission gradings too much anymore. Um, we do primarily like reflection, or at least in UV. I'm not going to speak for other wavelengths. Um, and then there is another one, uh, which is the most traditional method for using making gratings. Um, it's just very costly. Um, and that's, we have once more our little piece of silicon, and you have the world's smallest drill, the most expensive drill bit, go back and forth across this grating very slow and very meticulously. Um, in order to produce it. And then you take that and you use it like a post-it stamp on a bunch of other silicon wafers to transfer the pattern over. Um, but once you, that's like a very expensive process because you're having to calibrate this um, large machine that has to be down to producing things that are, well, this is 500 lines per millimeter. So um, something that's gonna be well beyond a fraction of a micron or so. And if you mess up, good luck finding where you messed up. <laughs> Thank you so much for an amazing presentation. Any further questions? We'll probably just take them, you know, one on one. Um, I don't think we have clear skies, do we? No. Then in that case, we have plenty of things in here to explore. We have the lessons in light in the back, which 
touches on this. And then we have the space web, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which this is an infrared camera and a regular camera. So feel free to explore. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Have a great day, guys. Night.